This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to Safari Live. My name is Lee Fuller. Behind me on camera this afternoon, my good friend BK. It's a warm welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve. It is uh, warm because it's 32 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Fahrenheit for those of you in the Northern Hemisphere. And on my way out here, I left camp a few minutes ago. The Impala were all sort of still huddled into the shade. It's still a bit warm before they feel like getting going. Usually, as the day cools off now, we'll expect to find them a bit more active. But as I said, we're in Juma Private Game Reserve, part of enormous uh, conservation area, the heart of which is the Kruger National Park. Park. The boundary extends over the Mozambican border into Mozambique, and we're on the western edge in these privately owned areas and we are going to be this afternoon trying to follow up on our female leopard tundi for you we had her this morning james had her in fine style quite hungry giving us uh, lots of uh, a run around in terms of trying to look for food she uh, had a few attempted hunts failed attempts james and very kindly took out uh, a few members of the crew after breakfast and uh, he told me exactly where he left her and it's not far below the dam cam in the drainage line to my right here and uh, in all likelihood if she hasn't managed to find something today she might uh, if we are able to find her give us a bit of a show and continue her hunting prowess this afternoon so without further ado we're going to keep driving and uh, go back to the area where they last left Tundi Leopards are ever the opportunists. So even in the middle of a hot day like today, if an opportunity presents itself, they'll grab it with all four paws. Usually, however, they'll be more successful hunting after dark. So while we head off and go and try and follow up on Tundi, over to Jamie, she wants to say hi. Good luck, Lee. I hope you manage to find her. A very good afternoon to you all and welcome to the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie. And this afternoon, behind the camera, being eagerly directed by jean -Dre, is Owen, who is here to interview as a cameraman. So he's potentially going to be freelancing with us. He's going to be interviewing. So please be kind. Please don't be horrible at all. Um, it is a very different thing that we do, but Owen's got plenty of experience in terms of camera work. So welcome, Owen, and let us see what we can accomplish this afternoon. I have no plans at all. I'm going to be as opportunistic as a leopard hunting. Lee's just been describing Tundi's approach to searching for food. That's going to be my approach to searching for animals this afternoon. We're just going to bumble along and enjoy whatever it is that we happen to encounter. And it cruise all the way down the western edge of Juma. Welcome to William, who is a new viewer. William, it's lovely to have you on board with us. Uh, most people describe this as their Safari Live addiction. I can't speak one way or another because I'm employed and paid to do this. But you want to know which country we're in. We are in South Africa, and to be more specific, we're in the sort of northeastern corner of South Africa. There is a huge reserve known as the Greater Kruger National Park, and we fall into part of the Greater Kruger National Park. The Kruger National Park's a, a government-run reserve, and on the boundary of the Kruger National Park, there are several different private reserves that are open to it creating an absolutely massive wilderness area that's larger than uh, some states and actually larger than some countries as well. So we're in a little place called Juma, which is right in the sort of the heart of the... Which way is that? West. Western side of the Kruger National Park. The western fringes, one might even be tempted to describe it as. So welcome, William. I hope you enjoy. Remember, well, you've just done this, but remember to keep sending through your questions. You can do that on hashtag SafariLive on Twitter 
or in the comment section of YouTube and let us see what we can find. South Africa, of course, I'm biased, a truly magical place with many different beautiful spots, but I just happen to think that this is the best part of South Africa, me personally. I've been living here for many years, so perhaps I am biased, but it comes with lions and leopards and elephants and anything really that a girl could want. Uh, it's not just Lee and myself out on this nice warm afternoon. I'm sure that Chloe is really truly enjoying the sunshine and the temperatures. Let's go and find out whether he's started to sweat yet. Good morning, good evening and good afternoon. It depends on your area coat. So my name is Chloe and joining us behind the camera is Craigie. And guess what? We have Hebivore. Hebivore, it's a game scout. Hebivore. Yes. So, welcome to the bushwalk. Our plan for now, it's simple. We are following up on uh, Shidulu's tracks. Shidulu is a female leopard that uh, roams around the western flanks of the reserve. Hopefully, she's still around because... Um, in the morning they saw her tracks and then she might be out of the reserve or she might be inside here but we are, we are praying we are crossing fingers that she's still around because I haven't seen Shidulu before and then it will be so phenomenal if I can see Shidulu on foot <sighs> so also Hukumuri the hawk stays around the area So, I'll also be looking for all these sorts of little things around here. But for now, while I'm still searching for all the pretty things, let's go to Lee on the other side. So we're driving very slowly along this drainage line. A drainage line off to my right is a dry riverbed it doesn't have any water in it now but seasonally after rains certainly there will be water flowing they are areas that are characterized by thicker bush from a vegetation point of view usually the steeper sides make for uh, quite a nice what we'd call in this country a donga or a little ravine or rivulet and uh, the thicker bush on the side of these drainage lines, ideal leopard habitat, usually a little bit more shade. Certainly Tandi, when they left her uh, kind of mid-morning, I think would have been heading into an area like this. Usually leopards are on the opposite 12 hour clock to us. So they have been resting all day and usually start to wake up now. I say usually, you know, nocturnal is quite a strong word, especially when you are referring to leopards. Nocturnal means night active, but we do very often see leopards active during the day. Kind of that activity is usually governed by their stomachs. So a hungry leopard might be up and about during the day looking for food a little bit more regularly. They do, however, have far better hunting success rates after dark and they use the cover of darkness to their advantage uh, they have fantastic night vision do leopards in fact so do lions and even though we can see them up and about during the day if they really are hungry usually they would spend the warmer daylight hours resting sleeping they would uh, spend a fair amount of time grooming, very typical of cats, they kind of besotted with staying clean. So this area in front of us here is the kind of perfect leopard habitat and that's what uh, we refer to when we talk about a drainage line. Susan, what happened, what would happen if Shidulu would Came across Kalamba. Well, 
Usually female leopards do tolerate one another. Uh, they'll have home ranges and uh, those home ranges on the edge of that home range will be a fair amount of overlap and usually they'd avoid each other. They are very solitary animals and they'd avoid each other either by sound or smell and uh, they would very seldom actually come nose to nose. So that area of overlap, that area of tolerance on the edge of their territories, we see them sort of bypassing each other without really giving each other too much of a second glance. So, we are search here. We're going to look down below us. Some lovely big shady trees. Leopards can sleep in the top of the trees, and quite often they'll, even without a carcass hoisted, they'll enjoy the breezes that come from 360 degrees around them. Also, a wonderful view. But they can also sleep and rest in the bottom, uh, on the ground here, in this shade. This time of year, especially with the bush turning, changing colors, so the leaves losing, the trees losing their leaves and the grass turning brown, can be a little harder to spot leopards. Watch the branches here, BK. We're going to carry on looking here and you're going to head over and rejoin Jamie. It's amazing how quickly the colours did change. Okay, this is admittedly the wrong area to have brought up this subject, but I'm just building off what Lee said. This particular area is filled with trees known as guari bushes and they stay green throughout the year so it was a bad spot to have chosen to talk about it but I really feel as though the trees changed color in the super haze uh, that must be from this morning um, in the space of around about two days when I arrived back at work it was still pretty green and then all of a sudden it turned yellow and felt like it happened overnight and there just leaves everywhere the reason I stopped talking halfway through that sentence is because there's lion tracks here. But I did pick up on the lion roars this morning and it sounded like they were on Buffles Hook. So I'm not going to waste any time tracking them. Those tracks are old. They're from last night or early, early, early this morning. So the lions are already on Buffles Hook, which is a property to the north of us where we cannot go. So that's where they're hiding out, I imagine. I hope that wherever they are, they're back together again. And when I saw the Inkahumas, was it yesterday? It was. Jeepers. It feels like half a lifetime ago, but yesterday morning, when I saw them, it was only six females. And they were missing some of their number, including the two young males, the Inkahuma male and the Mangeni male. So I'm hoping that wherever they happen to be, they're reunited once again. And they could have become separated for all sorts of reasons, but I mentioned yesterday, I suspect the evoker had something to do with it. There was something about his roar, not yesterday, but the day before, there was something about his roar that was hyped up. It's the only way I can really put it. And I suspect that lioness that was separated, she found her way back to the pride. I think he had something to do with that. But I'm hoping they're reunited once again. Looking at these tracks, it looks as though there's a male with them. But it doesn't necessarily, you know, tell us which one it was. Oh, it's windy. Winter winds. I think there's something coming. I think there's a cold front on its way. And it's been so lovely and warm. And they came from the... Let me just have a proper look quickly. Let's see if we can... Oh, it's a yucky spot I've picked, but it's the only place I haven't driven over them. Uh, there's lion tracks here, and there might even be leopard tracks. Hang on. I'm just going to have a look quickly. I'm just going to jump out. Lion tracks. These are very small tracks. 
Very small tracks. This is a lion track here. Can you see that there, Owen? Over there. That's the lion track. The back of the foot is here. The toes are here. Pretty unmistakable size. That's the size of the lion track. This is not a lion track. This looks like it might be a leopard track, a female leopard track as well. Here we go. I mean, in terms of comparison of size, they are worlds apart, and there's no cubs with any of the lions. I mean, that that track for a lion cub, that lion cub would be two months old. And we know that there aren't any two-month-old lion cubs, so I'm actually quite glad I pulled over. I would have dismissed those as lion tracks if I hadn't been watching carefully, which means I can also help Holly out with his whole tracking deal. There's another track here, going that way. Um, now, which one's fresher? So the way that we go th about that is we look at the tracks of the nocturnal animals. It's one of the reasons why it's important to know the tracks of nocturnal animals, like this genet that's walked next to it. None of them fall on top of the tracks going this way. That's weird. I think we might need to get Herbie in here to analyze this. I think she came through, had a sniff of Tundi's kill, and walked back almost exactly the same way that she came out. Now, typically when female leopards do that, I'm just gonna check one thing, and it's going to mean I'm gonna go right behind the car, so I'm sorry. Give me one moment, it's gonna make life very difficult. Um, I just wanna check here. She walked, now often when leopards do that, it means they're not on a territorial patrol. It means that they've made a kill and they've gone back to fetch cubs. I mean, that's not a guarantee, obviously, but it's unusual for a leopard to waste energy to walk in one direction and then walk all the way back. So I'm just gonna call Herbie for a second. Herbie, Herbie. Dumela, um, Herbs, there's tracks here for a female leopard coming towards or a sort of east along power lines and west at the junction with Impala Road. I'm sure it's her. It's her in capital letters. Hey, it's windy today, M4. Uh, ones look very fresh. Copy, thanks Herbs. I'm gonna go check Triple M. I'm not gonna drive over your tracks though. Thanks M4. Right, I'm gonna go loop around while I do that. Uh, we've been uh, talking a little bit about bushwalk and the fact that we're gonna help them out a little bit. Let's go and see what Chloe has, just somewhere over there, somewhere. Yes, I found something interesting here. If we can look at this, it's a nest. And this nest is uh, not functional anymore because the owners left this nest. But uh, what attracted me to this nest is that uh, if you can see how it's well constructed in this thorn tree. And this nest belongs to a bird called blue expels. And then this thorn tree is called a uh, knot thorn tree. Blue expels are brown and blue in color, so they they don't camouflage in this habitat. So what they do is they will construct their nest in these thorn trees to avoid predators. And if you can check these vicious thorns, they will deal with a predator trying to climb here. And this tree is easily recognized. You can see on the branches there, all over its body, it has thorns. So that simply means this bird is, I can say it's intelligent. So what they do is they use this grass called uh, bluegrass. 
very soft grass and very easy to maintain. Then they build this ball nest surrounded with, with an entrance. Awesome, hey? And as we saw tracks, uh, lion tracks, but uh, Habi said they've split. And then this male and female track, they go uh, together. Then Habi thought maybe it's a mating pair. Who knows, we might find them. Because uh, some, they said they're in Pefelsuk, but maybe they, they're busy there. So I'll be moving away from this tree. Yeah. Magic dragon wizard, I nearly poked my eye with this thorny branch here, but I'm, I'm, I'm safe. So I will be walking. <clears throat> and it's so nice to walk because you see all these small little things that we hardly see when we're driving. And that's uh, how I enjoy bush walk because If you can check how the this ecosystem interacts with each other or with one another, it's so amazing because without insects, we won't have uh, plants or, or grasses, and without grasses, we won't have insects. Oh, we have something interesting here, Craig. Come this side, and I've seen these ants, but I don't know their their name. If you know their name, please send that to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or YouTube chest room. So while I'm, I'm looking at these ants and trying to figure out their name and I'm waiting for your help, let's go to Lee and see what he's up to. Nice one, Proli. Yeah, walks are certainly enjoyable. But so it drives. I do agree with Jamie. I think there's some uh, weather on its way. This cloud has rolled in very suddenly. So when we left camp, gosh, half an hour ago, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And these clouds have rolled in. And there is a wind. I wouldn't say the wind is howling, but uh, it's definitely the strongest wind that I've experienced here at Juma in the last nine or ten days or so, which is an indication potentially of some weather inbound. Of course, with all our modern weather apps, we just, uh, at the tip of our fingers, have exactly what the weather's going to do. With a various uh, degree, with varying degrees of accuracy. Of course, I always enjoy working with uh, the local people, be it the Bushmen in Botswana and the Kalahari, the Shangan people from here, the Zulu people from where, where I lived, and there's always one or two usually an elderly man who uh, is 100 percent more reliable than the weather apps used to work with a guy called patrick magosa and we grew up on a cattle ranch and his job was a tractor driver and uh, that was in the days before there were any weather apps and dad would uh, make us all be quiet as we watched the seven o'clock news every night and at the end of the news the weatherman came on and did his thing and he'd say well this is the x percentage of X millimeters of rain that's going to fall tomorrow and uh, dad would say Patrick said it was going to be clear tomorrow <laughs> and anyway, you old Patrick McGorsell he was uh, he was right the vast majority of the time and I think as I'm not knocking technology for one second but we have become a little lazier nowadays things like reading maps we uh, all used to have map books and we used to study the map and work out our route before we went anywhere nowadays we have Google Maps on our phones shouting at us at every turn and every corner. And uh, we're involved with kids doing adventure education and outdoor education. And we do teach the kids how to use maps and compasses the old school way. I mean, GPSs are fantastic, as your phones are, but batteries go flat. And uh, they can also lead you on a bit of a wild goose chase, can a GPS. We're still on the lookout 
for Tundi and we've uh, kind of gone around this drainage line. We've checked the other side of it, we've checked below now and we're going to check this side of it. And here's a little red-billed hornbill. Is he also going to help us check for Tundi? I don't think so. He's got much better things to do like look for termites and ants or other insects that might feature on his high tea menu. Red-billed hornbill. Very busy. <laughs> busy birds running backwards and forwards. Oh, he got something there. I can't see what he got. Something a bit bigger. That took two gulps. They'll investigate uh, a lot of insect activity on the ground, will hornbills. And I think he's going to disappear over that ridge. Yes. There he goes. Nice to see the red-billed hornbill. Max has asked a question. What is the most common nest found in the bush? Well, C Max, I would have to say it would probably be a Cape turtle dove or ring necked dove. They think the most common, widely distributed bird in southern and east Africa. In terms of numbers, however, the red billed quelia, numbers wise, get into bigger flocks and there are more of them. In terms of biomass, they're more red-billed quilias than any other birds, but they nest in, in colonies, in big colonies of uh, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of individuals. And certainly if you bumped into a red-billed quilia colony, that would be the most common nest. But that is an interesting question. I suppose the turtle doves would make the most common, well, cup nest, what we would, if you think of a nest, if you close your eyes and think nest, you think the little cup-shaped, teacup-shaped pile of sticks with grass inside. But of course there are a variety of nests, including holes in riverbanks and holes in trees and some holes in the ground as well. So while we continue Looking for Tundi down here, are you going to head back to Jamie who has some news for you? I do have some news. I have some really very sad news and it seems very ill-fitting that I'm about to deliver it on Triple M. So perhaps a little bit later when we watch the sun go down, we'll just have a little quiet moment. I hate having to do this but I'm just going to rip the plaster off. The oldest in Kuhuma Lioness is dead. Scarhip has been found dead on Londolozi and it's probably around about two days old so essentially what we were discussing before has, prob has proved to be most likely correct. She was old, she was really, really old. I think at this point she was, what was she? She was 11 or so. Still had a, potentially a few years left in her. But with that injury, she'd been losing condition on and on and on. The good news, just to, to let you know, is that both of the males are okay. They're there as well. They're just quite lying quite close to her body. And one of the sub-adult Nkuhumas is mating with one of the evokers. So we've sort of had a full rite of passage. Our, this is our first time knowing that the Nkuhumas cubs have reached the point that they are now three years old and ready to mate. It's a bit of a rite of passage for them. But I'm, I'm actually quite devastated that Scarhip has died. I mean, I had a feeling it was coming. I actually said to James this morning, I have a feeling we've seen her for the last time. Um, I'm really, really sad. I should be checking for Shadulu's track so I don't waste Herbie's time, but I'm 
a little bit distracted. I have a lot of amazing memories attached to that lioness. When the chaos of the Birmingham boys hit in 2015, she was the one who led her sub-adults away and disappeared off towards Simbambili. Um, she was always the one who, when there was chaos with males, separated and kept the, the youngsters safe. Mm. I remember her vividly with the middle group of cubs in 2016 when they started to breed once again. And I'm really sad. I'm really, really sad. I was really rooting for her. And I knew, I knew this day was coming. And we all know it's part of the natural way of things. So, you know, there's nothing untoward in her death, but you're allowed to be sad without being angry about it. Omkar, um, no, we don't know what the cause of death was and to speculate would be silly. I have my own feelings about what happened, but I'll only get into trouble for saying them. So not from anyone at work, but just people will take offense to the fact that I have my suspicions. I really feel as though there was a fight and I think she got caught in the crossfire on Londo's, but we have no evidence of that, no proof of that. I have pictures of her, but I'm not going to show them to you because she doesn't need to be remembered that way. It's not necessary. They're not, there's nothing particularly revealing about them. She, you know, you can see that it's her with her big injury on her hip and um, there's no sign of bite marks or anything like that. She was looking to my mind better when I last saw her, but let's face it, she'd been losing condition. She'd been thin and limpy, and that wound was just not healing. And I think it's just the natural process of things. But it's quite sad. It's very sad. I'm just listening to Herbie for a second. Never mind. Something smells funny here. Sorry, just give me one second, guys. I know this is a really momentous moment, but life carries on and there's a lot of talking happening in my ear. Oh, shh. All right, never mind. I give up. Sorry, people are being chatty. What were we talking about? What was Ilana's question? Sorry. I'm irritable now. I think it's just sad. Oh, um, Ilana wants to know whether or not any of the sub-adults were her cubs. Yes. She actually had two sub-adults, one male, one female. The male was the only remaining male and she'd done a marvelous job with him. I mean, he was looking healthy and she was always, interestingly, always the most, to my mind, accepting of the lionesses. Oh, what am I talking? Yes, of the lionesses. She was always the one that approached the Mangeni male. And I wondered to myself at the time whether or not she knew that it meant support for her son when he disperses. I mean, that really is taking things to perhaps a ridiculous level. But I did wonder. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry to be the bearer of that news. I think a lot of you are going to feel the way I do. It's just, just sad. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to sit here and feel very sad for a little bit. While I do, off you pop across to Lee, who I'm sure is going to do his best to, to cheer everyone up. So just above there. Yeah, really sad news. Not uh, not good to hear that at all. But on a more positive note, we have a pretty bird hiding behind some branches. It's a magpie shrike or long-tailed shrike and the wind is uh, really picking up now in this same tree where a whole lot of its 
family members. Oh, look there. Herbie, <laughs> Herbie. Hiding. <laughs> look at that. You can appreciate the wind now. The hairstyle Sorry, of the grey go away uh, bird getting blown all over the show. <laughs> it is exactly the same colour as this tree. Obviously trying to hide inside there to get out of the wind. But it's mohawk crest blowing in the wind. You can really appreciate how, how strong the wind is blowing now. Okay, copy. There's nothing on power lines road. Is there anywhere you want me to check? Grey go away bird. A fairly dull grey bird. He's grey from the tip of his beak to the tip of his tail. Not a colour in sight on the grey go away bird. Oh. But you still are beautiful. That is a really cool hairstyle, I think. So if you don't have bright colours, you can have a cool hairstyle, especially in the wind. And you can also have a really cool call if you don't have bright colours. The grey go-away bird is named from an onomatopoeic point of view after his call. go away. Go away. The early hunters would have uh, named him that. He would have squawked at the hunters, giving them away, shouting, go away, and all the other animals would be alerted to that. So that's its contact call as well as an alarm call when it feels a bit threatened. Quite nicely protected. Look at all the thorns surrounding it there. It's uh, well protected in its little cove or cage that it's made for itself almost. Oh, the wind is blowing dust everywhere now. So no sign of Tundi where we are. We're on the dam wall of Vuyatela Dam. The dam cam is just to our left. And uh, we are gonna be leaving this area. I think we might, towards the end of drive, pop back down here. There's a chance that uh, she could become a little more active as the afternoon cools off. Cool, so we are going to head on a little bit and go and see what else we can find. Quite often wind I have found over the years is the single biggest climatic influencing factor on game viewing. And I don't want to paint a picture of doom and gloom but generally we saw less on windier days for whatever reasons the animal animals are a bit more skittish. This wind will not only and make a noise inside the ear lobes themselves so the wind actually bypassing the ears will make a noise but it's also the noise that the leaves and the branches of the trees make and the grass make so generally the prey species are a little more nervous they're a little more jumpy they can't hear the approach of a predator as easily as they normally would And we're going to carry on uh, driving now, and you're going to head down and join Chloe on foot. Yes, we are still here on foot, and we are lucky to see there's f slightly fresh tracks of a leopard. You can see these two tracks here, a leopard track. We have a hind uh, foot and a, and a front foot. This one, it's a front one because it's slightly broader and uh, bigger than this one. This one is slightly small, it simply means it's a, it's a hind foot. And looking at these tracks, they came from the east and then they went west and then she turned again to the east. Then we saw tracks of a kudu running and Heavy said he thinks that the lady is hunting. Because uh, some of the tracks, they're not far from us, 
they look as if she was stalking and stalking. So it simply means she might be hungry. So telling you about these tracks, going back to them, because we, we, we also have lion tracks here. I will, I will show you the a different in terms of sizes. You can see this one is the front one. And uh, the female leopards, they tend to have like eight centimeter track. And then a, a lion will have about 14 centimeters. And coming to this track over here, a lion track, Craig. Oh, let me watch the antenna there. We have a track here, a lion track. And compare the size. This one is huge when you compare the size there. This is a lion track. And it's easily identified by the lobes. It, it tells us it's a cat. And the sizes can tell you whether it's a female or male, left, or front, hind, or front. You can tell also the behavior of the, of the animal just by looking at these tracks. It can tell you whether the animal is running or sick. Because when it's sick, it will drag maybe a tail or it will like drag, not the tail, the, the feet. Or sometimes when they walk lines, they do this. When they are limping, they will, you will see something like these markings, and then you will see a track here. Then that's how you tell whether this animal was struggling to walk. Interesting. We might find this cat. Who knows? So heavy, still searching, ah, still tracking, because the substrate is 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 not good for us. And the other thing that's problematic, it's the wind. It keeps on making these tracks look very old and difficult. Sinek wants to know, is there any news on Tingana? Sinek, I haven't heard anything about Tingana. Let's come here. And I want to show you something here. Yes, we have a track. Craigie, come in and, and look here. This is in this area here. Look how difficult the substrate is. We have a track here. It's a leopard. It's, it's this one, heavy, and the team is following. You can, you can see the lobes here. One, two, three. Let me take a, uh, like a stick and draw this track for you. It has registered here because it simply means it was... Uh, trying to stalk a prey one and two a little bit confusing here because the the hind one is on top of the front one so you will think maybe it's on a track and then we have a toe here and we have here and then we have this one here and then we have this toes magic hey so who knows we'll be lucky to see Ah, she do low on foot. So but for now, while we're still figuring things out, let's go to Jamie. Maybe she has some great news to tell us. Koli, I would really, really like it if you would find Shadulu on foot for me. Because then I can drive in and see her for the first time ever. And that would be, that'd be a nice way to cheer me up. So I'm hoping that Koli is successful. Obviously, we're trying to help him as best we can. So I'm just looping around. I don't want to drive around too much close to those fresh tracks because I don't want to actually drive over them potentially. Obviously, on foot, you've got a much better chance of spotting tracks than you do on a vehicle. So it sounds as though tracks car carried on moving to the east, which is good. It means she hasn't crossed over onto Arethusa. So that's where we're going to go. We're going to go slowly make our way along. Rexon's also been helping a little bit. And maybe we can figure out where she's been. I still haven't seen her. I really, really would like to. I've heard many a story about the lovely Shadulu. As Seb told me in no uncertain terms that as soon as you say her name, then you're guaranteed not to see anything on drive, which I feel is relatively ridiculous. I'm not. I'm trying not to be superstitious like that. But if we see nothing on drive, then we'll know why it is, and then I'll have to stop 
from then on. I managed about a quarter of a drive after he told me that before I let slip with her name. I'm just not very good at that sort of thing. So of course Tundi's been spending a little bit of time in this area. She had her impala kill right on what I would consider to be, having never seen Shadulu before, but what I would consider to be the boundary of her territory with Shadulu. So it's quite possible that Shadulu went and sniffed, smelled Tundi, moved away, came back. It could also explain her backwards and forwards approach. windy. This is where it gets a little bit scary walking through the, the thick vegetation because all you can hear is leaves rustling and your ears actually start to let you down because you can't distinguish between the rustle of an animal and the rustle of just leaves rustling about. It's a lot of the word rustle in one sentence. <laughs> what do you call a boy sitting in the autumn leaves? Rustle. Remember that you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or in the comment section of YouTube, just a reminder, because apparently you guys are very quiet this afternoon. So while you think of some interesting questions to ask us, or if you pop across to Lee, who I have no doubt will ins ah! Never mind. Go across to Lee before I lose my hat. Thanks, Jamie. We uh, would all love to see Shadulu. I certainly would as well. Who wouldn't want to see at any time? Well, we want to see leopards, but we might have to see yellow-billed hornbills for a while. Here in front of us are no fewer than three yellow-billed hornbills on the ground. They normally may form monogamous pairs and mate for life. The yellow-billed hornbills, as well as the red-billed hornbills that we had earlier, and they, uh, a few other bushveld hornbills here, we talked a little bit about nesting. And they have a fascinating habit of excavating. Well, they, they use an already excavated hole in the tree and the female will go in there and the male and the female will enclose the entrance to that nest to that hole with mud and they leave just a thin slit and she can stick her beak out and uh, in so doing receive food from the male when he has the unenviable task of feeding himself and her and the chicks when they're born so she lays her eggs and hatches her little chicks inside the protection of that hole in the tree and she'll undergo a full molt when she's in there and then uh, peck her way out when the chicks are big enough to to leave the nest. Those two hornbills off in the distance now have uh, concentrated their efforts on a pile of elephant dung. Oh, not for long. Anyway, elephant dung is usually actually quite a nutritious place from a insect eating bird like um, like a hornbill they'll uh, be concentrating inside the elephant dung lots of dung beetle activity there's the larval stages of other uh, beetles as well anyway we had a little water hole here and uh, this open area in front of us we thought maybe a bit more productive, but alas, it is empty. So we shall continue our search this afternoon. We didn't see any tracks. Georgie's asked, where in the bush would you find yellow-billed hornbills? Well, perhaps, Georgie, I can answer that question with a question where in the bush wouldn't you find a yellow-billed hornbill they're on the ground they're in the trees
flying in between the ground and the trees, flying between the trees and the trees, they're everywhere. They're absolutely everywhere. But their habit of choosing a, a nice big cavity in a dead tree as a nest site is the only kind of predictability in terms of where you expect to find them. And the great wildlife filmmaker of East Africa, Alan Root, sadly he passed away a couple of years ago, but Alan filmed a, a wonderful documentary uh, many, many years ago. Just watch out here, BK. And he had hornbills nesting, and he, he was the first guy to get a camera inside a nest, and he actually excavated out the back of a tree and put a glass back to their nests their nest and uh, put a camera in there and you watched this whole process evolve over uh, what I think took nearly two months. Quite an incredible documentary, well worth watching if you get the chance. What he did have to do was change the glass fairly often because the kind of exposure to the light meant that the hornbills kept wanting to try and uh, clad up the glass and they kept attaching mud to the glass to try and block off that uh, back side of the nest. Well, here we have, up in the tree, a European roller, I think, and it's being harassed by a lilac-breasted roller. No, it's a purple roller. So it's a purple roller, that bird there, a member of the roller family. All the rollers are magnificent. Not the best light on that purple roller, but he was being harassed by a lilac breasted roller. The purple roller is not as common as the lilac breasted roller, so nice to see one. Now that lilac breasted roller has stopped his harassment for whatever reason. Usually it's to do with nest site competition. So like the hornbills, the rollers also use cavities and dead trees to nest. And there'd be a fair amount of competition around the potential nest that they're after. I've got a picture here in the book of the purple roller that we are looking at. And have a look at that for an impressive page in the bird book. That is most of the roller family, look at them all beautiful blue. And down number five, the bottom left hand corner, that's what we are looking at. The purple roller, used to be called Rufus Crowned Roller, has lovely rich indigo blues in his wing like that. Quite impressive are the roller family. I'm going to turn the page and you're going to see another two beautiful rollers, broad build roller there number four another beautiful member of the roller family blue-throated roller west african rainforests and jungles so this page here are more the rollers that we find <coughs> excuse me the number three the most common lilac breasted roller that was what was harassing that bird yes a comment that the rollers are so cute they are indeed very cute birds indeed they i'm just gonna have a sip of water all the wind blowing all the dust around has settled in the back of my throat they got their name rollers from the display flight so both the males <coughs> excuse me and the females are both brightly colored and beautiful looking birds and um, the males in order to attract females will roll and tumble and somersault in flight and it's quite an aerobatic display <coughs> excuse me so you don't see it often but when you do see it it can be some fairly impressive aerobatics <coughs> excuse me so we're we going to continue on and you're going to head back to jamie Okay, 
So I have an update for you about the tracks for Shadulu. We're going to do one, check one last place, and then I'm going to let poor Owen film some animals and not just the back of my head. Because I've been quite focused, just because I know that Shadulu often makes only brief appearances on Juma before wandering off. And there's a good chance that that's what she's going to do this afternoon. So I've been trying to track her quite quickly. Those tracks were fresh. <clears throat> and Rexon's picked up on her tracks coming in this direction. So we're just going to check one last spot and then we'll stop for things like impalas and rotors and so on. So I've just got a loop round on this road. It's it. Rexon says that it looks as though she was hunting the impala uh, in this direction. So he's lost her tracks for now. Obviously when a leopard is walking casually on a road, it's a lot easier to track them than when they are running or even stalking, because when they stalk, they shuffle around, they don't necessarily put their one, you know, they don't necessarily keep, lift their foot up immediately, is what I'm trying to say, they shuffle, they move it from side to side, so it becomes obscured and it becomes very difficult to actually track a stalking leopard. So we're just gonna check here, sorry Impala, well, you're beautiful, we'll get back to you later. Have you seen a leopard? No. No. Not concentrating on leopards at the moment. The male impala are totally one track minded right now. We are now really truly upon the point of the proper breeding season. Oh, but that's so cute. I can't drive past that. I just can't. We won't miss Shadulu because of five minutes. We might, but. Hello. Hello. Yes, you were the ears. Were you cute? Yes, you are. That's so lovely. One, two, three, four, five, six kudu. And the little ones were watching us with their massive radar-like ears. And now the attention of one... F now only one focusing on us is this female here. That's lovely. I'm going to stay here for a little bit longer, sorry. I'm going to stick around and because this is nice, it's a nice opportunity to see Kudu. We actually, last Kudu we saw was the one that Lalumba was trying to pull up into a tree. So it's nice to see these chaps around. There's also a male that I can see behind the bushes. So you can sort of, I don't think you can see him now. He is going to pop out at some point, I imagine. They're such lovely antelope. They really, really are truly elegant. Long limbed and sort of almost like fashion models, or catwalk models. And they've even got a very graceful stride when they walk. And it's also worthwhile when you're tracking a leopard in the way that we are, getting close to where her last tracks were seen. So it's also always a good idea to stop and have a look and gauge the behavior of the animals around an area. Are they looking nervous? Although, to be honest, it's, it's a little bit unfair to try and judge their behavior now. Because remember how I spoke about this weather being a bit scary for bushwalk? Well, it's much scarier for the antelope that have to watch out for leopards or various other predators. Oh, that male. Now, oh, and just to the right of that marula tree is currently attracting a tree. There he goes. There we go. So there's actually two males here and the one is displaying to the other, warning him away from the females. Thanks so much, Rex. I'll keep following up around this area. Maybe we get lucky.
Okay, copy. Thanks. Did you drop Mendoza or not? Copy. Thanks, Rex. Okay. Well, with this lovely collection of kudu, we're going to carry on searching. Just in case Shadulu is about to cross, Ta uh, Rexon's told me she hasn't yet, which means we're in with a chance. While we attempt to find her, let's go across to Koli, who's got a very similar mission in mind. Yes, we are still here on the push walk. We're not lucky yet to see Shidulu. But we saw this beautiful mushroom here. I don't know its name. I haven't seen it before. And the coloration, uh, they're more like a leopard. You can see they have some uh, spots and some white color, some tony color, some brown color. It's beautiful indeed. And what's so amazing about this mushroom is that it's growing just on top of this uh, branch of a uh, this plant called a jasmine. It's a plant that crawls. And then these mushrooms, my granny told me that they are poisonous, I don't have to eat them. But there are these ones that they grow big, I used to eat when I was in the bush. Uh, and I was still a kid. We used to go and just cover them with uh, with some uh, rocks, avoiding the the cattle to eat them. But these ones, they don't look delicious because they might be poisons. And not every mushroom is consumable. I told you I'll be making Craigie to to nail this afternoon. This mushroom, I don't think it's edible, but it looks yummy because of the colors. It's not, uh, oh, oh, look, look, Craigie, we have impalas here. Here, here, just here, just here, here. They're rotting. <laughs> Amazing, hey? <laughs> they nearly came straight at us. Nice one. <laughs> this is the, the reason why predators like lions and, uh, and, and leopards, they they go for impalas, especially this time of the year, because they don't concentrate much on their surrounding. They think of mating. So the other great thing is that Craigie was using this. Craigie, before we go to back to that mushroom, Craig was using this as a tripod stand, because this is a very heavy sand, nearly a rock that is made by the termites. I don't think it's still functioning because uh, we found it here lying. Maybe it was kicked by an ellie. You know, elephants sometimes they tend to go to the Temat mounds and take out their frustrations there. Or sometimes they scratch, they scratch them, scratch themselves there. Because this sand you find here, it's very soft. And what they do is they use their, their mucus and their droppings to make this great and durable material out of sand. Awesome, hey? What does it look like? Craig? Sometimes I, I, I think these uh, things, they look like, you know, when you look at the moon with the camera. So, I'll be moving forward. Maybe I'll see she she do hunting those impalas because they don't concentrate much around themselves. So let's go to Lee, who's also driving around. <coughs> well, good luck, uh, Koli. I hope you can come up with the ultimate prize there. We still on the hunt for some animals. Uh, 
been relatively quiet up until now but of course as you know this is live and that can change any second you can send through any questions and comments you have for us hashtag safari live on twitter or use the youtube chat stream most of the animals we've seen including that forked drongo BK, can you get him there on the dead branch over there? Have been keeping a low profile. Oh, where'd he go? Up into the air, more than likely hawking an insect. <clears throat> Question from Luna. What is my most memorable experience with animals? Well, I have so many. How long have you got? <laughs> I would have to say that uh, I've been very fortunate to do it a few times. That one hour that you spend with mountain gorillas, I rate as the most humbling wildlife experience and I've done it in Uganda and I've done it in Rwanda and it is exceptional it's one of those sightings I was saying the other day you think more about it before during and after the sighting an exceptionally powerful sighting really incredible to spend time with big hairy humans and straight in front of us on top of that dead tree ah he's also ducked off it looked like a hawk eagle oh well now we all never know unless we come across it again but it was a big bird of prey sitting on top of the tree in front of us and it ducked out the way so <clears throat> you know most of the birds and things that we've been seeing have actually had their heads down in fact he's landed again he's off in the distance we'll endeavor to get a little bit closer and try and get an ID on him for you but yeah most of the birds have had their heads down we've also seen solitary impala males on their own and they're all in the thick bushes trying to sort of hide out of the way of the wind not ideal if you're a prey species these windy afternoons like it is now it certainly counts to the predators advantage all of this wind the trees moving and the sound of the wind in your ears are able to mask BK can you get a shot through there no let's reverse a little bit let's stall our car and then reverse a little bit so we're looking at a, a raptor one of the birds of prey up in the top of that tree there there and it might be a martial eagle actually on first inspection so yeah that dark brown wings dark back mm, I don't know if he's big enough to be a martial eagle And a martial eagle normally has a little bit more of a crest on top of his head, I think. This could be a black-chested snake eagle, though he's not sitting very snake eagle-like, and he's got feathers all the way down his legs. The snake eagles have... Oh, off he goes. The snake eagles have featherless legs. It could have been an African hawk eagle. Hard to say, he's disappeared now. I'd have to narrow him down without us seeing his chest or his front. We'd say either black chested snake eagle or martial eagle or African hawk eagle would be my three guesses there. Any other comments would be welcome for the birders amongst the viewers. Always a bit of a challenge in the wind, you know, the eagles don't sit as proudly as they would normally chest out chin up 
He had his head down into the wind, trying to escape the wind. My guess is it's probably Mina Nu. How do you tell a bird's gender? Well, there's a few ways that you can tell. In the birds of prey, we've just been looking at an eagle, the females are bigger. Not what you would think. So in the birds of prey, the females are bigger. And that theory behind that, or one of the theories behind that, is that the bigger female is a, is a better incubator. So she has more body mass, more size to incubate eggs, the male being smaller. You know, the birds of prey often form monogamous pairs. So the male being smaller would be arguably a better hunter. He's a foster, more agile flyer. As a general rule across the bird world, certainly a lot of the passerines or perching birds, the males are brighter colored. So they've grown elaborate uh, plumages in terms of color and size of feathers and crests and long tails. And that's to attract females. So that can often be a good giveaway. Sometimes the calls, so things, for example, like an Egyptian geese, so the female Egyptian geese, Egyptian goose, she honks, honk, 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 and the male hisses. Easy way to remember that, I often tell kids, is it's not really that different from being at home. Mom making quite a lot of noise, moaning at dad for doing things wrong, and dad going shh, shh, shh. <laughs> So you can tell by size, you can tell by color, you can tell by call, and sometimes you can also tell by behavior. So males will rather James Richard said it looked like an African hawk eagle. Yes, sir. I would tend to agree with you, James Richard. The only thing that made me doubt that it might not have been is we so often see African, oh, hold on. Going on a road less traveled here. Rusty's plowing on fearlessly. The only thing that I might doubt there, Richard, is that African hawk eagles, we always see them in pairs. Well, the vast majority of time we see them in pairs and that was one bird. They could have easily been temporarily situated or separated. But yeah, I think um, the fact that what we did see of the top of its head is it's more of a flattened head as both the Marshall and the black chested snake eagle have more crests. So yeah, I would uh, tend to agree with you there, sir. Well done. So we were talking about bird behavior and be able to sex birds based on their behavior. So males would generally be the ones showing off. So like the rollers, so the male and female rollers look identical, but it's the males that do this display flight where they tumble and somersault and roll, and that's where they get their name from. So that's how you tell the difference between birds. You're gonna go back and join Jamie now, who's still searching. I'm on Mendoza Road, which is, as most of you know, it's this new road that um, sort of was created while I was in the Mara, and so far I've had absolutely zero luck on, ever. I have never seen an animal on this road. I think I've seen one Impala, that's a lie. I think I've seen one Impala. I had such high hopes for it at one point, but unfortunately, it's never quite delivered. But this is where Rex and thinks Shadulu is. And I'm obviously not going to question him on that. Now so here we are, driving very, very slowly on Mandor's Road. All I can see is the tracks from the enthusiastic runners from earlier today, but no leopard tracks. Chandra, you were running this afternoon, huh? Yeah. There was nothing on this road. Okay, so she's moved about in the middle of the day. Alice, oof, there's no tracks of her cubs. Alice wants to know if Shadulu will have the Hukudulus with her. 
the Hokodulus, of course, being her cubs. And we, I haven't seen them, obviously, I haven't seen Shadulu either. If she makes a kill, she will go back and fetch the cubs from wherever she's hidden them, and she'll take them to the kill itself. We had two sets of tracks, backwards and forwards, but further to the north of this position, but there were no sign of any cub tracks, and I haven't picked up on, Rexon hasn't picked up on any doubling back of any kind. So she could make a kill, go fetch her cubs and come back, but at the moment there's no evidence that her cubs are with her. I think so far the only person to see the Hukudulus was Trishala, if I'm not mistaken, right on the boundary. I, there is, it's questionable also whether or not she'd bring the little Hukudulus onto, onto Juma, this far into Juma, if Tingana were calling. But I think, I'm pretty sure she'd be confident enough to bring them here, because Hukumuri does patrol this area regularly. So obviously she wants to keep the cubs where ever there's a male leopard that thinks he is the father, it really is irrelevant as to whether or not he is. If he thinks he is, if he's mated with a female, those cubs are safe. So she wants to keep them, uh, we don't know if she's mated with Tingana, but we probably would have heard if she did. We probably would have found them, unless maybe he disappeared into a different area. I with her i think we would have we would have heard about it so so far the most likely suspect when it comes to paternity is hukumuri and she will know that too and she'll be keeping them in this general vicinity mm. i've not seen one track coming out nothing so she might well still be in here between this road and Zoe's road. We're gonna do one loop, one more loop once we back out onto Balanites and then we'll go check around again. But we'll be slower this time. We won't rush anywhere, we'll stop for all sorts of things. At least we know she hasn't crossed as far as we can tell. enough and a very warm welcome to H. Solomon who is watching as far as we know for the very first time. H. Solomon wants to know if we have any snakes here and the reason I said funnily enough was because we did actually see a snake a little bit earlier. Unfortunately it was one of the ones that is phenomenally quickly quick moving and it shot across the road in front of me and then went back across behind me. Owen actually spotted it the second time round. So we do get snakes. We've had a few snake sightings. We've had a few nice puff adder sightings recently. Mm. And we had, a, the, of course, truly amusing incident of the sand snake that tried to slither up Tristan's trouser legs. We've had, we have not had, touch wood so far, any serious incidents with venomous snakes in our camp. That doesn't mean it couldn't happen, but you know, Often you find that mumbas and cobras, particularly cobras, you find they tend to, nav to be drawn to a human area because humans, of course, make a mess, and mess brings rodents, and rodents bring snakes. You often find in camps, well, camps I've worked in in the past, that we've had to remove a spitting cobra on the odd occasion, which we haven't had to do in a long time. We moved a puff adder a few weeks ago from the the vehicle bay where we put where we park the cars at night and i had a spotted bush snake come out of the rain covers that was actually really really nice it was a stunning sighting a spotted bush snake is a completely harmless snake it's a very tranquil snake very very relaxed and as we put the roof on because it was raining we put the roof on the car and it came down out 
and it actually went all the way across my arm, across my back. And then I tried to very carefully transport it to the side of the road and it promptly fell off. I felt a bit guilty, but it was fine. No damage done. No harm done at all. I hate this car. This is Tristan's car. <laughs> it doesn't idle properly. I don't know why Tristan is so fond of this car. Hey, Rusty. Sorry, Rusty. It's exactly the wrong idling speed for me, personally. The speed I like to go at. Okay, around the block we go. My word, it's a problem with this sort of weather. It sends a lot of the animals into hiding. We're driving around searching for something, and Lee is doing exactly the same, searching presumably for something else. Hate's a strong word, Jamie. I hate Rusty. Don't hurt to have. We're in Wendy and we love driving Wendy. Yes, we do. So having a short wheel base to drive around for a couple of weeks is right up my alley. So I have a soft spot. Sorry about that everyone, apparently Lee has vanished off your screens, never fear, we're here to scoop everything up and put it back in its place. This is the last track of Shadulu going in, disappearing that way, so we've done a full loop and now we're really just walking on, working on hope more than anything else. The bushwalk team I don't know if they're still planning on following up on these tracks, or if not. I can still see our tracks here in the road. I'm actually not sure what happened to Poli. I think they're probably still making their way into this area. I've, of course, never walked Shadulu, so I've got no idea what she's like on foot, but I have heard she's a lovely leopard and she's quite relaxed. Speaking of bushwalk, I imagine that they're strolling about somewhere not too far away from me. Let's go and find out whether they're going to carry on looking for the leopard or if they have other things in mind. Yes, we are still searching and searching and searching. What we have found now is a plant called baboon's tail. It's easily identified because of the shape like a baboon's tail. It looks very dry, hey? Wait for it un until it, it blooms. The best plant you've ever seen. And you might think that it's dead, but it's not. It's, uh, and they have this sharp edges here. And they, they are bluish in color. Crazy is it blue or gray? Blue. blue. I'll go with blue. So we are still searching for she Shidulu. We saw a vulture perching somewhere around this block. Then we thought maybe you might just go there and, and check because maybe you might be lucky to see a leopard feeding or a carcass. Who knows? But we were not lucky. We were not lucky. So hey before he's still searching. And looking for other signs maybe you will be lucky but in the meantime we are not
at Heavy. Heavy is Heavy is whistling. And he said we must we must stop here. I'm sure he's suspecting something. Because in the bush we have to communicate whistling or doing this. Tipping your hands. Says we might 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 come. Because this place is thick and then we have to we have to be extra careful. Hey before. Ooh, Craigie, long and tenderly. Come here, Craigie. Come and see here. This is a scrub hair carcass. And check this out. And this is fresh. This is fresh. And this is what heavy saw because he doesn't uh, want us to, to maybe corner a leopard or be in danger. So as you can see, this is the lake of Squap Hay. And this is fresh. The meat is still tender. <clears throat> yeah. So this means luck we are so lucky who knows next we will see a leopard so we'll follow up on these tracks because heavy left the spot and following up on those fresh tracks but for now let's go to lee and see what he's doing i do hope it brings us some luck Coley. we need it this afternoon we had a few gremlins while we were talking earlier and I was talking about uh, our beloved car, Wendy, and how much we love short wheelbase land drivers. I don't mind a land cruiser, the old land tour de land cruiser versus land rover debate can go on until all hours of the morning. But I do have a special affinity for land rovers, especially short wheelbase land rovers. We, um, my wife and I bought a short wheelbase Land Rover called Peggy Sue. She was a blue short wheelbase Defender. And uh, after our wedding, we didn't have the time to do a nice honeymoon. We just went away for a few days. But then I uh, two safaris to guide in Tanzania back to back. And there were two short safaris. I think they were eight or nine days each. We said, we have the time. Why don't we drive to Tanzania and take a long honeymoon and that's what we did so 11,000 kilometers so that's about eight odd thousand miles and she did not give us one day of travel I can uh, see the Land Cruiser fans rolling their eyes um, and we do miss her we had to sell her she was getting a bit old and troublesome as old Land Rovers do and uh, I'm not very sentimental but my wife is but I must Estimate being back in a short wheel base Land Rover is heaps of fun. So whether you're a Land Cruiser, a Toyota Land Cruiser fan or a Land Rover fan, you have to acknowledge that a Land Rover is better off-road and can go more places in terms of pure 4x4 ability there's not much that touches a Land Rover. They are, of course, quite temperamental and they do... Uh, well, someone said to me once, a Land Rover is not a car, it's a hobby. Because <laughs> you... <laughs> unless you're a part-time mechanic, there's no point in owning one. And yes, you do need to spend a fair amount of time under the hood. In fact, I always do chuckle in the uh, car park every time I come and grab one of the Land Rovers for drive either in the morning or the afternoon you have a look underneath when we're doing the checks and there are numerous drip marks and puddles of oil that uh, come out of the Land Rover engine but as long as you check the levels every day and keep them topped up and yeah they're only about well <laughs> only about 20 things that go wrong with Land Rovers but Usually the Land Rover mechanics become very expert at 
telling you what to expect or knowing what to expect when a Land Rover comes limping in on the back of a low bed. Of course, Land Rover don't make Defenders anymore. Much to the Royal Family's horror, but I did enjoy seeing the new adverts for the new Defenders, which are much excitement in the press. Uh, I don't know if they have been released or whether they've leaked pictures, but uh, in classic Land Rover fashion, the first picture of uh, the new Land Rover Defender is of the Queen herself driving a Defender with her scarf wrapped around her head and a couple of corgis in the passenger seat next to her. <laughs> I thought that was very cool. Ben asking, do you get a long wheelbase Land Rover? Yes, Ben, you do. You get a 90, so that is the distance 90 inches, or I think it's 90 inches, between the axles of this short wheelbase. You get a 110, which is the standard issue, so the vast majority of Land Rovers are 110, and then you get a 130, and that's like a double cab, extended cab. That's an extra long Land Rover. So with technology on the go, there are game viewers in the vicinity here that are powered by electricity. So they have big batteries and they dead quiet, which is uh, absolutely fantastic for game viewing, I think. These are petrol Land Rovers. The vast majority of Land Rovers you come across are diesel engines, but diesel, as you know, can be quite noisy and especially for filming. Right now, I mean, well, there's a lot of wind blowing around, but right now you can hardly hear the sound of the petrol engine idling along but those electric cars and they're putting them the big battery packs in the bonnets of land cruisers and uh, with a range of about 45 50 kilometers perfect for game drive so jamie on rusty over to you I know. Uh, hate was probably a little bit of a strong term for Rusty. I don't actually hate her. I just prefer Wendy. There's something about Wendy that I, we just get each other. No, don't, what, no. I, I hate this weather though. That I do. Yeah, nothing stays still. I was trying to stop for those male Impala and they've all panicked and run off. And you can't blame them. Imagine how terrifying it must be. We've often spoken about this. How. Stop it. Okay, stop it. Stay. How terrifying it must be for an animal that relies almost purely on its hearing for, you know, and sight as well. I mean, impala are really difficult to sneak up upon. I've tried it many times to try and test what it must be like to be a leopard. I've tried to creep up close to impala. I have never succeeded. They are so, so alert. But imagine how disturbing it must be to hear leaves rustling all the time. You can't rely on your sense of smell or hearing. There's movement all the time as the leaves blow around. And you can understand why they are so skittish. And just bear with me. I'm going to reposition so we can see them properly again out from behind the bushes. But while I do that, I'm going to, um, I'm going to go get hold of Lee and just find out where he is. Because I've just got an update from one of my friends at one of the neighboring reserves. So I just want to see where he is. Lee Lee. Lee Lee. Silence. Ah, there he is. I always get him on the second go. What's your position? Okay, copy Lee. Um, Kuchava is on Chitwa, on Gauri Main, um, very close to Cheetah Cutline. Uh, you, I thought maybe you'd be a bit closer, but I think we're about equidistant at this stage. Uh, 
is a female leopard on Chitwa, very close to Cheetah Cut Line, if you want to make your way there. No, no problem. Um, I will make my way. I'm a tree house now, so it shouldn't take me too long, if you're happy with that. Cool, should we go see Kachava, folks? Let's go see Kachava. Sorry, Mel Impala, you are lovely, but we're going to have to go and fight our way into a sighting on Chitwa. So we're going to leave you for now. And we'll go see what she's up to. I haven't seen Kuchava in a while, so I'm okay with that. I might not have managed with Shadulu. But I am going to go and find Kuchava for you. All right. While we race off, and it'll take us a little while to get there, off you pop across to Trolli to find out what insect life he's going to enthusiastically teach you all about. Yes, we have something incredible happening here. We stopped a little bit while we were still following those trucks because we saw this precious thing happening here. These small little insects, which are called the harvest uh, termites. They are still busy scissoring some grasses here, preparing for winter. They have to work all summer, gathering some grasses, piece of grasses, and and they take them inside there. And these ones, they don't uh, operate like like the fungi growing termites, which they build these huge mounds. These ones, they they only create a hole, then they dig and drill down, then they, that's where they stay. No matter if you see them on your, on your lawn or garden. And they also have a queen soldiers and workers and the size difference tells whether this is a a worker or a soldier and they've stopped a little bit here because it's getting windy but some are still outside here They're still scissoring just like this one craig i don't know where to find it. You see this one mm. Mm. yeah let's let's just try that one because it's still scissoring there is it? Yeah. It's what they do all day. Amazing, eh? And they don't. The coloration is different. Yes, and the coloration is different because the fungi growing termites they have this yellow, orangey like head. And the body is it's white and these ones are brown in color so they camouflage very well within their habitat and this shows that uh, we might we might see something like an art park who knows because they they love feeding on these ones or a pangolin This one is, just came out to collect a stick there. And look how powerful this is. Look at how long this grass is and the size. Oh, there. It's trying by all means to, to grab that and put it down into a hole there. You can see that these are crazy looking guys. Yes, indeed. And uh, if you can look at the way they they lift these long pieces of grasses, and if you can look at their um, their size difference, it's so amazing to see such thing happening. Awesome. And that's a piece of a uh, sawtooth love grass. And that one is still patiently scissoring and trying to cut that grass there. Shame. But it won't give up because he knows 
it has to go down there and survive winter. Ha! Ah. Heavy is calling our name. Let me stand up and follow those tracks. We'll be losing light soon. So it won't be easy for us to to see these tracks. And we have to rely on some other calls like alum calls. <sighs> so I won't give up until it gets dark. But for now, let's go to Lee who's also searching. Thanks, Trolli. Well, we've nearly jumped out of our skin, these rutting impala. Uh, we were driving on a, quite a bumpy road slowly in quite thick bush. Well, I nearly jumped out of my skin. I don't know about uh, BK. But a roaring impala, impala ram came running very close to us and let out a huge roar that uh, did give me a little bit of a fright. So this writing activity really reaching a crescendo now. The vast majority of mating behavior happens now in May between the full moons and we almost bang in the middle of the two full moons now in May. We here now at Buffelshook Dam and uh, there is nothing moving around at the dam. We were hoping to show you something at least. The water, as you can see, is drying up every single day. These hot, windy days certainly don't help. And we're going into winter now. And the situation is not fantastic. It's going to be a long, dry winter. BK, I don't know if you can get, there's a little three-band, uh, oh, where'd he go? He's just disappeared. There was a three-banded plover there. And he's disappeared. There's a blacksmith lapwing at the back there. Uh, a little bit to the right back. Yeah. There, if you zoom in now. There he is. Blacksmith lapwing. Never far from the water's edge are blacksmith lapwing. He'll be concentrating his diet. Oh, there's the three-banded plover. How about that for luck? In the bottom of your screen is the little three-banded plover. Hard at work acquiring himself some dinner. He'll be going through the mud there. He's got a fairly slender bill. And he'll be picking out little water or aquatic animals. There'll be maybe little midges larval stage of some insects perhaps some of the smaller crustaceans maybe little snails three banded plover now playing hide and seek while he hides we'll look at the blacksmith lapwing who diet wise will be after much the same as the little three banded Real Dan, have animal populations decreased since I've become a guide? Yes, they have. The IUCN has just declared very recently in the last few days that uh, there's more, of, more than a million species now threatened with extinction. And yes, conservation is under huge strain. At the moment, as humans develop and populate this world, what we're doing is squeezing the animals into smaller and smaller little islands. So these game reserves and national reserves, national parks are getting 
pressurized on the edges by more and more demand for space by humans. So yes, animal numbers have decreased in the last 19 years. But I think if you had to look back over the last sort of 200 years, there's been quite a rapid deterioration in a lot of wildlife populations throughout the world. The human population, of course, has done the complete opposite and skyrocketed, increased almost exponentially. And we were talking about it earlier today. I think it's the feeding of all of us that is causing the biggest headaches in the world. Feeding, if you're a blacksmith lapwing, doesn't give you a headache at all. Quite fun. You can squish around in the mud and feel it ooze between your toes. That's very sticky mud that he's in now. It looks like he's using his beak, gleaning something off the surface there. Something small. Quite hard work, you can imagine, uh, you know what it's like to be walking through soft mud. Not easy, every footstep is an effort. So whatever he's after there, must be worth the effort. So the vast majority of wild animals time is spent looking for, and looking for food and feeding. And it's all an energy equation balance. The energy that you expend looking for food must not increase the energy derived or obtained from that food that you're looking for and obtaining. So you and I can wake up and set our watch almost to meal times and meals land in our lap whereas out here the little three-banded plover and the blacksmith lapwing are doing what animals spend the vast majority of their day is doing feeding and you never know when or where your next meal is going to be so when the going is good you better fill up the tank quite a good example of uh, little niche habitats here so you've got both birds occupying this muddy pond and they are each going to be feeding on a slightly different food source and hence they can live side by side and we see that a lot in the animal world lots of symbiosis everybody getting along very nice scene well Let's carry on searching. The wind all of a sudden has died down. Maybe that'll change our luck this afternoon. Let's hope that it does. You are now going to join Crawley with a creepy crawly on the walk. Yes, we are still trying our level best to follow these tracks, but we saw this beautiful and colorful spider, which is called a golden upweb spider. But what's so interesting, we saw something again around its web. What made us stop here it, are these spiders here, which are called the dewdrop spiders. I don't not really sure whether Craig will, will get that because it's windy and the web is moving left, right, center. But he, he will try his, his level best. And what they do, these do drop spiders, they are kleptoparasites. means they will steal from their host. What they do is they will build their web, extending it from their host web. And then they will wait for whatever that is caught there in that uh, host web and then they will steal it and it will go back to their web. Interesting. So they are waiting patiently there to have an opportunity to get maybe a 
a mill before it gets dark. Craig, are you winning there? Because the web is moving, they are also moving. And remember, if they, uh, they are caught in this web of a golden orb spider, they might be devoured by this spider here. It's a female, huge, colorful, and the males are small and brown in color. So it's been moving around because it's it's windy and it it's disturbed a little bit, thinking that maybe there might be a predator lurking around. But we are still searching. For now, while we're looking at our spider, let's go to Lee. So I'll forgive you for thinking that it's a tortoise because we are on land and it looks like a tortoise, but it is a terrapin. And terrapins are usually associated with water. We're not far from Biffelsook Dam, but that dam where we were a little while ago, you saw how it was drying up and uh, not surprising to see the terrapins moving home. This is a marsh terrapin. They belong to the family of Shalonians, their closest relatives, of course, are tortoises on land and turtles in the sea, in salt water. So terrapins are fresh water Shalonians, tortoises are land Shalonians, and turtles are sea Shalonians. Anyway, he's just ducked off the road there now. Let's try and catch up with him. He's not a very big one. He can probably fit quite easily into my hand. Can you get him there? BK, he's now stopped in the grass. No, nope. to the left of that. There he is at the bottom of the screen. Oh, he blends in pretty well. There he is. You can see his little head and eyes now. Blink, blink. Look at those eyes. Beautiful patterns on the marsh terrapins. Heads, you can see some fresh mud, some wet mud on his back. And yeah, despite the fact that he's out of his usual habitat of the water, he's quite comfortable out here and he's going off in search of greener pastures, more water. Although, out here, this time of year, I think where he was in Biffelsook Dam would be his best bet if he just sat tight. So they are reptiles, or terrapins. All Shalonians are reptiles, and as a result, they are poikilothermic, which is a fancy word and means that they rely on the sun to regulate their body temperature. They rely on an external source of heat, whereas you and I and all mammals rely on internal sources of heat. We rely on our metabolism and food to regulate our body temperature. And what you find this time of year, as it cools off and as their food becomes less abundant they go into a state of estivation which is very similar to hibernation hibernation more associated with change in temperature and those drastic conditions in the uh, more cold parts of the world where snow and ice prevail in the winter that's hibernation but out here where it does get colder but nowhere near as cold as that it's more reaction of less and less food availability and it's a state of dormancy east of ocean is a state of dormancy just like hibernation where an animal like a terrapin would dig its way into a riverbank or into the mud next to a lake or pan or dam and it would slow its metabolism right down and bide its time until the rains come back and usually, in this part of the world, that's towards the end of the, end of the year, perhaps October. 
Sam asks how strong a terrapin's shell is. Well, I'm not quite sure how to say it's as strong as a... Well, I think if I stood in it, so I'm 90 kgs, which is just under 200 pounds. If I stood on one this size, I'm not going to, I promise you, I would probably break its shell. So this is quite a small one, but the bigger ones would be able to withstand me at nearly 200 pounds standing on them. So very strong, very strong indeed. Surprisingly strong, that shell. Lions often, out of inquisitiveness, usually the youngsters will uh, investigate and they try and bite and can't quite get purchase on, uh, you know, something like that. It would fit in the mouth and could be bitten, I think, by lions. But that shell is surprisingly strong. Good protection from the elements. And you're going to head back to Jamie now and hear some updates from her side. All right, so we've arrived at where Kuchava, in theory, was, unfortunately. But I've been trying to get hold of any of the vehicles on the radio. And as you know, sometimes our radios, our game drive radios, don't work terribly well on Chitwa. No one can hear me and I can't hear anyone. And they've clearly all left her because I can see where the off-road tracks come off the road. But they've clearly left her. And I don't know if that means she went north onto Torchwood. I can't see any tracks going north. But there's a possibility I might have missed the There she is. Never mind. Hey! Well, hey! Hello, pretty girl. You are a sight for sore eyes. Beautiful. Perfect. Oh, this is going to be pretty. So pretty. Are you still nervous, girl? I haven't seen, I haven't been up close to her in a while. Kuchava obviously means scared, means nervous, because in, in her early youth, she was quite a nervous leopard. She's now older, more experienced. She's five years old now or so, I would say. And, and oh, gorgeous. You've got that proper tundy look on your face this afternoon. Is the wind getting you down? You and me both. So for those of you that don't know, this is Kuchava. She is Tundi's daughter. And she has sort of occupied the territory a little bit to the south and to the east of the areas that Tundi's been hanging around in at the moment. Obviously, she's currently on Chitwa. That's why you can see there's a mast behind her. And I really don't like that mast, so I think I might move in a little bit. Oh, gorgeous girl. She might move for us. Such a big sigh, Kuchava. What have you got to say for yourself? Now, she, of course, had cubs or was seen with suckle marks a few months ago. Unfortunately, those suckle marks didn't materialize into wonderful cub sightings, so it's strongly suspected that she lost those cubs, which would mean that round about now she would be due for a second litter. She's got he's something about Tundi's offspring. It's that ears to the side face. That ears flatten to the side. I don't know what it is. Tumba used to do it. Tlalamba, I actually haven't seen her doing it as often. But Kuchava and Tumba, always. Was that nice and cozy girl? I didn't expect her to be on top of a termite mound. I really didn't. Littlefoot says that she looks fed up. Yes, she does, rather. She does look a little bit fed up, but that's actually just Kachava's natural expression, something that I fully sympathize with. I often get caught up in my own thoughts and I come across as fed up when in reality I'm just thinking about life, which actually will probably make you fed up 
no matter who you are. But Kuchava does have a fed up expression on her face, always. She's got droopy ears. In fact, of all of Tandi's offspring, I feel as though it's the most pronounced with Kuchava. Only way I can get that antenna out of the shot is to actually move forward, and I'm worried about her. She seems all right, though, so let's give it a go. I'll try move forward a little bit just so that we can get rid of that. Hey, girl. You okay with that? You look like you're going to move. I would. Hey, you good? Are we good? There we go. Thank you, girl. It's as close as I'll push it. With a leopard, I don't know that well. I remember seeing Kuchava for the very first time on cheetah plains years ago and she was only about three years old no she must have been even younger she must be about two at that stage and i was told she was in kanyeni and i was looking at this leopard and looking at this leopard thinking it doesn't look like in kanyeni but she's beautiful nevertheless doesn't look like the pictures i've seen of her and at that point i don't think kuchaba even had her name yet you know, she was named by Shanae, who used to work at Nkoro. It's a good name. Kuchava, I think, is a really, really lovely name. It's got such a beautiful ring to it. Shami says that she also has long whiskers, like a Tlalamba. Yep, I completely see what she's talking about. All the, all leopards have beautiful whiskers, but Tlalamba really does have a fine set of beautiful white whiskers, and so does Kuchava. She always looks so sad. I know, girl. Don't worry. Everything's going to be fine. Pretty cat. I mean, really. She looks like she should be in Winnie the Pooh as Eeyore. I don't blame her, though. This windy is miserable. I'm sure she wants to just shelter behind the termite mound. Why, why are you sitting on the top? It looks thoroughly uncomfortable. There we have it. We actually got lucky there. I thought for one second that we weren't going to find her, but we did. There she is. That was a really, really nice surprise. At least I've given Owen something to film, thank goodness. That's a massive relief. I was starting to worry he was going to have to film the back of my head the entire afternoon. Plus, of course, we have a Wild Earth Kids Drive a little bit later, which means that we, well, we'd love to show them animals, ideally. All right, well, uh, Jono and I have just had a discussion about the sunset. I say it's it's nice, but it's pretty average. Lee clearly disagrees, so does Jeanre. Let's go and have a look at Lee's sunset and tell me what you think. Another beautiful Juma sunset. Isn't that pretty? Well done, Jamie. Good result there, my friend. And I hope you've all been enjoying Kachava. We're enjoying the beautiful colors painted on the western horizon there by the setting sun, which is behind those clouds now. And if we zoom back out, we notice some rays of the sun and uh, we'll see them shortly radiating up, <coughs> excuse me, from the sun. They're very faint, and towards the top half of your screen now, you'll see them up there radiating out. Those are called crepuscular rays. And those are the rays of the sun's last light as it disappears behind the mountains and the western horizon. So it's the sunlight shining through the gaps, the irregular horizon, as well as the clouds low down. 
And they sometimes, you can't see it tonight, but sometimes you can see them extending right the way across the sky to the east. And they bend, or they look like they bend. Of course, it's the era of parallax. Those are parallel lines. But the era of parallax, which is the perception that train tracks, if you're standing on a railway line, train tracks getting closer together the further away they are. So it's just a distance and perception thing. And the same thing's happening here. So those lines, those crepuscular ray lines, are actually parallel. Crepuscular from the French word the crepuscule, which means dawn or dusk. One of the many French words the English have stolen and added to their dictionary. And it is a wonderful opportunity in the bush there's hardly a day when you're out here that you don't enjoy the sunrise and the sunset. I think it's such a busy time of day in the real world when you're either driving to the office or heading from work to the gym or doing something work or family related. But out here in the bush, we seldom fail on a daily basis to sit back, relax and enjoy these minutes as the sky changes colour. Really, really pretty. I think that if somebody had to paint that, I'm not sure what colours they'd use or what colours they would uh, attempt to use. Always amazing watching as the colours change. Always amazing after such a hot day to quickly feel how cold it gets. Clouds Gate, a question, would the rays also depend on the dust in the atmosphere? I think they certainly would. The more dust there is, the more visible this uh, phenomenon is. And yeah, the more dust in the air, especially coming up to this time of year as it gets drier and dustier, and also smoke makes the sunrise and sunset more beautiful in terms of colour. Although I have seen those crepuscular rays on very clear summer days in terms of, you know, quite uh, undusty conditions. But I'm sure that dust particles in the air would enhance those rays. Indeed. Very nice. Well, we are going to continue our search have about an hour or so to go, and I know we're going to welcome some kids very shortly. Let's see what we can find for the kids and the adults in the next hour. So we are Gonna head back to Koli, who's on foot. Well done, finding Kuchaba. I only saw Kuchaba a couple of times, and I was lucky to see Kuchaba while I was live. But the, the, the problem was, uh, I I was with her for a few times when I was, I was live because she went deep into a a low signal area but I was lucky to spend time with the cat so I think we, we decided to head back home but as you can see it's getting dark and be on foot in the darkness it's uh, not good sometimes because we, we don't have IR light or flare with us here if we did we might be walking around these thickets so maybe, who knows, you know, the last minute cats 
they they love showing themselves to us. So maybe we'll be uh, seeing Chidulu or the Hook because we are still at their territory right now. Hopefully we'll see them. Amazing, hey? Yes. And I love the bushwalk, hey? I'm not saying I don't like driving, but the bushwalk is, 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 especially when I'm with my lucky socks. So, let's go back to Kuchaba while I'm walking back home. Which way around? What's the problem? So we've come back into the area where Shalamba was. We failed to find her this morning. We failed to find her or the carcass. Remember that uh, kudu calf that she caught yesterday? So we're just taking a long shot. In all likelihood, she has moved out of the area, but um, we were in the city, so we thought we'd pop in for one final look around here. Usually as the sun sets and the temperatures drop, we expect to see a bit more movement from the leopards. So if she has been lying full belly under a shady tree for the day, she might get up and start feeding again now. She was off to our right here in the bush here somewhere. Shelly, do all cars in Safari Live have names? Yes, they do. All our game viewers, game viewers have names, Shelly. I'm in Wendy. And I know Jamie's in Rusty. And Jigger is the third member of our fleet. We just stopped here while we were answering car name questions because BK thought he smelt something. I'm just going to back up a little bit. Let's go back. That uh, smell we had this morning was of the intestines or the partly digested stomach contents of that kudu. Quite a pungent odour. But we never found the carcass or the leftovers of the carcass and we could be smelling that now it's about here hey BK yeah so lots of wind swirling so if we do smell something it can be a little confusing We're going to say goodbye to the viewers now and switch over to the kids' drive.
afternoon or good evening and welcome to this Wild Earth Kids Drive. A very warm welcome to Trantwood Elementary School as well as to the Chalkley First Grade. Apparently all of you guys have been on our live safaris before so that means that you know exactly how this all works but just in case you need a quick reminder about what this is all about all about. Uh, my name is Jamie and behind the camera is a gentleman called Owen and we are sitting here in South Africa where the sun has just gone down and it's getting rather chilly and rather windy and what you're seeing is happening right here in real life. So for you lot it is the morning but for us it is nearly night time and we're sitting just a few meters away from this really beautiful animal now because what you're watching is not like watching a movie it's actually happening in real life right now what that means is that you can send through your questions so anything you've ever wanted to know about African wildlife you can ask us now as we take you out on safari now it's going to get dark pretty soon but that's okay because that's actually one of the most exciting times to be out on a safari as it gets dark most of the animals actually start moving around a little bit now jose well done you've sent through a question jose wants to know whether or not leopards have sharp teeth. They do because they are carnivores. That means that they have to eat meat in order to survive. So they need sharp teeth because they can't actually go to a grocery store. They can't just pop down the road and go and buy themselves some nice pre-packed meat. They have to go out and catch their own food. And to do that, they go and they look for something like an antelope and they creep up on them and they grab them and they eat antelope. So they do have very, very sharp teeth. They have, their teeth look a little bit like your dogs or less so your cats, more your dogs at home. Obviously it's slightly different because they belong to the cat family, not the dog family. But you know how your dogs at home have long canines? Leopards do too. Now, as she gets more restless and as she gets ready to move, she'll probably yawn at some point and then you'll be able to see just how sharp her teeth really are. She's also got very, very sharp claws. And I know that it's a she because she is quite small and I actually happen to know this leopard quite well. But before we go into that, I've mentioned that it's getting dark. So before it does, why don't you head across to a gentleman called Polly, who is out on foot and very soon will have to be moving indoors. Hello, boys and girls. How are you? I'm doing good. My name is Polly and joining us behind the camera is Craig. And we have Heavy Vore. Heavy, our game scout there. As you can see, it's getting dark here. We are heading back to the tent so we can be safe because there's predators all over the place and some animals. So we don't want to be caught in the middle there. So I'll be showing you all sorts of things in the tent because we have bones, we have insects, all sorts of interesting things. So we're looking for a leopard. We're not lucky because we didn't find it, but we saw it footprints fresh ones and we saw where that leopard was feeding then we didn't manage to spot one isabel wants to know where the leopard live isabel check this habitat this area this is where leopards like to live oh isabel I think we have something here, like an elephant. So heavy, my game scout. Shh. Elephant. We might see an elephant. Thank you. 
F and look at that. We have an elephant bull. This one is a male because it's alone. The males, they tend to leave the head. So it's about 150 to 200 meters. We are very safe because it's not aware that we are here. Nothing. Do you know how big is that? It's about 13,000 pounds. And I want, just want to sneak a little bit forward. I want to show you its track. It's big, it's huge. I want to show you its track. Here's a track. I don't think it will be much visible, but it goes here. Look how big the track is. And we have two. Uh, not this one. It goes here. Look how big this foot is. And if I can put my look at this huge track hey awesome did you enjoy that <sighs> so we're leaving because it's getting dark we're going to a safer place because of these things what we saw now now so let's go to Lee my other friend he wants to say hello Hello, boys and girls. My name is Lee, and my friend BK is on the camera this evening. We are looking for animals for you. We haven't had much luck up until now. Not as much luck as Koli or Jamie this afternoon. But we are going to continue to search. We're going to try our best. How we look for animals here is we usually drive around in these cars, and these cars don't have any doors. They don't have any cab or window and they're perfect for looking you have an unobstructed view when you drive around and uh, we are looking as we drive for animals in the bush as well as the footprints of the animals in the road that sometimes lead us to the animals so without further ado we're going to continue and drive and look Kalia has asked, how much water do the plants need in the jungle? Well, Kalia, firstly, this isn't a real jungle. So a real jungle, the plants would need a lot of water. And a real jungle, <clears throat> all the trees would be much closer together. And we would have what's called a canopy, a closed canopy. So the canopy is when the trees actually close out the sky above your head like this. So despite the fact that, that look, this looks potentially like the jungle, these trees aren't very tall, as you can see, and also their canopies or their crowns, their leaves don't touch and form a, uh, a cover above our heads. So in the jungle, the trees would need a lot more water than these. These African trees in the savanna here of Africa actually need surprisingly little water. And usually we uh, only get rain for about half of the year. So about five or six months of the year when we would get rain. And uh, yes, we can get by with surprisingly little rain in this part of the world. The jungles and a rainforest is, as the name suggests, a place where you get lots of rain. And uh, rainforests would generally get three or four times the amount of rain that we get here. Usually this time of year, we are going into our winter down here in the Southern Hemisphere and it's getting colder and cooler. And usually we don't get much rain at all this time of year. Most of our rain falls over Christmas time actually, when it's our summer or rainy season. So it's starting to get colder here. We get nowhere near as cold as you do. But it does get a little cooler here. So you guys are going to go back and join Jamie with her leopard.
It definitely feels a little bit chilly this evening, even if it doesn't get quite as cold as it does in the northern hemisphere. So I've already got my jacket on and I've got a blanket wrapped around my legs. But Kuchava, of course, and all of the animals, they actually can't really escape from the elements so if it rains they have to just find themselves a nice dense bush and go and hide underneath that and if it's windy most of the time they will probably move up against something to block the wind although I don't there we go now Kuchava's up oh Kuchava you were meant to show us your sharp teeth she gave us a little bit of a yawn there but unfortunately she was facing away Jake, I think you want to know if leopards bite. They do. They definitely do. Um, Kuchava is a wild animal, so I couldn't go up and pet her. She would actually not just bite me. There's, she could actually probably, in fact, she would actually probably kill me if we were, if we put her in a position where she felt trapped and I tried to touch her or treat her like a pet, she would probably kill me. Sitting here in the vehicle, I'm perfectly safe because she feels there her sharp teeth, perfectly safe. So she doesn't feel that we're a threat to her. She doesn't see us as food, but you definitely wouldn't want to go up and touch her or even get just a little bit close to her. I've been on foot with angry leopards before and I've been in the vehicle with angry leopards before and they are very, very scary. Now, Aaron, you want to know why she is sitting on the rock. The answer to that, well, first of all, it's actually, I know this is a small point, it's actually not a rock, believe it or not. That is a huge structure that is home to hundreds of thousands of termites. So that is a termite mound. That is the home that they've created out of dried mud and sand. But the reason that she's sitting up there is because there is a water hole not far away from us. So even though she's sitting up in the wind and it's not very comfortable, you can see now she's looking in the direction of the water hole. And that's because at this time of day, a lot of the animals go and have a drink. So by sitting up there, she can look across and she can see what animals might be moving about and whether or not she could actually hunt one. So she's sitting up there because it's taller than all of the surrounding areas so she can see a little bit further. Now Madison wants to know if leopards always have spots. Almost always, but you do get a very rare type of leopard which is called a melanistic leopard which is almost completely black but if you look really, really carefully at a melanistic leopard, most of the time you can actually see their spots underneath their dark coat. So even melanistic leopards, even though you don't think so at first, look as though they don't have spots, they actually do. So yes, it's one of the ways that we identify whether or not we're looking at a leopard or one of the other big cats. Uh, Zakahari wants to know where her family is. So Zakahari, unlike the lions, lions are social cats and they live together in something called prides. Leopards are actually solitary. So leopards uh, move around on their own. The only time that you'll see leopards together is when the female is something known as east in estrus or heat or when you have a mother with babies. So in this case, Kuchava is five years old, so she's grown up, she's left her mother. Her mother actually lives a little bit to the north of where we are now, opposite to the direction that she's looking in, but that's where her mother lives. But she never goes to visit her mother. She actually doesn't get on very well with her mother at all. And that's the same with all leopards. Once they are old enough to move out and about on their own, then Look at that tail. Then they will get cross even if they see their daughters or their mothers or their sisters. Okay, let's go. Otherwise, we're going to lose her. Let's go see if we can catch up with her. Let's 
So I think she's probably going to walk towards the water and there's a nice big path here. So let's go see if that's true. Yep, there she goes. She's walking straight towards the water. Okay. While we catch up with Kuchava, and we will catch up with her shortly, let's send you across to Lee, who's also doing a little bit of driving. So we're still driving and still looking. You can see in my hand I've got a big spotlight or flashlight. And I'm shining in the bushes as we drive on either side of the car. And it's getting dark now. Ali, where are you right now? I'm right here in my car with my light. Ali, I'm only joking. I am in South Africa, which is a country right at the bottom tip of Africa, the big continent. And I'm in a place called the Kruger National Park which is very close to the boundary with another country called Mozambique. And we're in an enormous national park and game reserve. We're actually in a neighboring game reserve. There are no fences between us and the Kruger. And this big chunk of wilderness is usually full of animals that we're going to try and find you. And we're going to try and find you specifically the animals that come out after dark. So we have a word that we use to describe animals that come out after dark, night active animals, and it begins with N, N for Nelly. And if you guys can tell me what that word is, day active animals, we call diurnal or day active. No, ah, I nearly said it. Well, I gave you a clue. If you can tell me what the word is that we use to describe night active animals, things like owls. Lions and leopards tend to be more active after dark, so do hyenas. There's other little predators called genets and civets. They look like little spotty mongooses. So you're going to go back to Jamie and I think her leopard is moving over to Jamie. Sorry about that, everyone. I couldn't actually hear anything there, but it's okay. We're all sorted now. There's the lovely Kuchava. She is uh, curled on a dead tree. So she's moved down from the termite mound that she was on and she has snuck a little bit closer to the water hole. So leopards really, really like to be secretive. They don't like to be seen. They prefer their own company and when other animals see them, they actually get a little bit frustrated. And she's looking off across to see whether she can spot anything. Do you see how large her eyes are? She's looking out into the distance. Massive pupils. Now, just so you know, if you are sending through your questions and I'm not answering them, you mustn't worry. It's just because where I am at the moment, we clearly struggling to hear so we're going to try that one more time because i think I, I heard a question coming through we'll try that one more time while we look at kuchava and then we will see what nina was trying to ask me nope nothing uh, Joel wants to know if leopards have predators. Thank you, Jandre. Jandre can hear what Nina is saying, even though I can't. Um, 
Yes, leopards do have predators, although we wouldn't really call them predators because they don't necessarily kill leopards to eat them. So their biggest threat out here is a leopard and oh, a leopard, a lion. And, li and hyenas can also be a threat to leopard cubs as well. They're not really a threat to the adults. The, the adults are able to get away from them. But hyenas do kill leopard cubs and lions kill leopards as well. Sometimes even wild dogs, although that is a very, very rare. All right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna need to just shift backwards a little bit, just to see whether or not that helps me so that I can hear your questions. Hang on, all right. While I figure that out and while I try to find a good place so I can hear properly, Lee's got a beautiful view for you. We're looking at it and so is he. The man on the moon is watching you. Well, it's getting darker here where we are in South Africa. Unlike you guys, who have just started school. And there's the moon, or a sliver of the moon that is uh, starting to become visible. Leela asked, how do animals protect themselves from predators? Well, they are very good at protecting themselves from predators most times. They usually hang around in groups. They use their sense of smell, their noses. They use their ears and they listen. And they use their eyes and they look. And that's how they stay out of the way of predators. These night active animals that we're on the lookout for now, I asked a question earlier, what is the word we give to night active animals? And Javanen was 100% on the money. He said nocturnal and nocturnal is the name that we give night active animals that come out when the moon comes out. So I suppose you could say the moon is also nocturnal. You can see the craters on the edge of the moon there. It's not a smooth marble-like surface. It's a very rough mountainous surface up there on the moon. BK has got a very big camera lens on his camera. And that's why we can zoom right in. Well, we are going to zoom right back out and carry on our search for more nocturnal animals. Isn't that a nice scene? That sliver of the moon. It's called a waxing moon. So when it's lying on its side like that, it's often filling up and uh, it's getting bigger and bigger. We're heading towards full moon. A waning moon is it's if it's flipped over on the other side and it's emptying. So if the um, the uh, moon is, is the upside down equivalent of what you saw it now, then that is a waning moon. So it's emptying, getting smaller. Danaea asks, how do animals find their homes? Well, depending on which animal you are, depends on how you find your home. So usually, as a young animal, you'll learn from your mother and father, as you guys do, where your home is or what your home should be. So some homes are a little hole in a dead tree, perhaps. Other homes are nests of birds in in trees. Most animals don't have a home as such as we know it, so they don't have an enclosure and a roof. The animals that use holes in the trees or birds' nests are probably the most uh, typical animal homes in terms of what we'd expect a home to be, but most animals that live out here just live in the grass in these dry riverbeds, one like we're crossing now, in the trees, and they move around. Ah, there's our first little nocturnal animal. And 
we'll tell you more about this little animal after you've had a chat to Jamie. Okie dokie. So, Kuchava is on the move once again, and I can sort of hear your questions every now and again, so we're just going to keep working with what we got because we don't want to lose the beautiful leopard who has stopped here right on... Uh, she's going to actually walk out in front of us. You can see how intent she is. So she's definitely looking for food. Now, Amir, as we spoke about... And just have a look at her belly there for a second. Beautiful. Um, Amir wants to know uh, how leopards get their food. Amir, they hunt their food. So that's what she's doing at the moment. She is moving through an area going towards the water and she's looking for prey. Now, unfortunately, as it happens, this open area towards the waterhole is actually, we're not really allowed to drive there. It's actually closed which is very unfortunate because it means that our leopard is slowly going to disappear and what I'm going to have to do is go all the way around and then hope we catch her at the water's edge. And she's stopping to clean out her claw sheaths and stretch her tendons and mark her territory. So as I said, leopards have to hunt their food which means creeping up on something like an antelope and catching it and eating it. So that's where leopards get their food, same as lions, same as any of the cats. All right, we might have lost her now, but we're gonna try and see if we can move around to where we can drive and we can find her again. Oli, fortunately, has made it safely through the darkness and he's now ensconced in the tent. Welcome back, boys and girls. I'm here in the tent. I'm safe from that elephant. It moved away from the area we're at right now and we are here settling in the tent. It's a little bit windy and we're keeping it safe. So here we have the skull of a leopard, not the one you saw with Jamie, but this skull here, which is a leopard, it's next to a uh, baboon skull. And if you can look at the size difference of these two skulls, because uh, leopards, they are predators, but they can be predators uh, uh, to other animals. And baboons are also known to kill leopards. And as you can see, the the size of these skulls, it tells that baboons can grow slightly bigger than leopards. And if you can check the the canines, these are the canines of a baboon. And I think this one is the male baboon because the male baboons, they grow bigger than the females. And look how sharp this is. And compared to a leopard, a leopard uh, canine, look at it and look at the size and it's a little bit not pointy. Freedom, how old does a leopard get? We have a male leopard here in Juma. Here we at right now. It's his territory. It can get very old because we have a 13 year old male leopard. And it means if he leaves, he can be 14, 15, or maybe slightly 16. Yes. And so. What they do is, when uh, hunting these leopards, let me show you something. When they hunt, they use these canines, these two teeth here called canines. They suffocate the prey because you know, you've seen that the leopards, they are brown and black and a little bit of white. So they well camouflage. They don't use speed to hunt their prey. They only use their ambush behavior. They surprise the prey when hunting. So, and then they use these ones to cut the meat. Isabel, how do I get the skull? You know what happened, Isabel? We are living in a uh, place where these animals are roaming freely. And then, as I've said, leopards can fall prey to other 
predators. And then sometimes it gets sick, sometimes it gets old and die. So these skulls, we took them around the area. So we don't kill animals to get these skulls. It's a no-no. Not in this place and not anywhere. We don't allow to kill animals. They are so precious. So this is what they do. And what they do is we have these incisors here. These incisors, leopards, they also use them to pluck off the fur of the of the prey, like an impala. They use it to take off the fur. Because if we can check uh, the droppings of leopards, they don't have much fur in them like lions. It's easy to identify their droppings. So I still have a lot to show you in the tent. Hopefully the time is still on my side. But for now, let's go to my friend who's driving around. I hope you were all well behaved children last month and I hope that the Easter Bunny bought you lots of eggs. Well this is an African Easter Bunny and his name is Scrub Hare and he's actually not a rabbit. He is a hare. And the main difference between rabbits and hares is the size of their ears. Look how long his ears are two enormous long ears and hares have much bigger longer ears than rabbits his eyes are shining very brightly because it's dark now and you are watching on your screens through infrared I can't actually see what I'm talking about and as I look at I've got a little screen in my car here but if I look out to where he is and he's only about 20 foot away Paige has asked, can nocturnal animals see when it's dark? Yes, indeed they can, Paige. And one of the reasons they can see so well is the size of their eyes. Look how big his eyes are. It might be a her. Look how big those eyes are. So they have very big eyes and then their eyes are specially adapted to see after dark. So you and I can see in the daytime, but for all intents and purposes, we are night blind. Unless we have the headlights of our car, or a flashlight shining for us, we can't really see in the dark, but these animals can, especially the nocturnal ones like the scrub hare that we're looking at. And you can see what this scrub hare is up to. It's having breakfast, so it's been resting and sleeping for most of the day now. Oh, having a little scratch there, itchy spot on its ear. Oh, that feels good. Scratch behind the ear. So it's been sleeping. And now it's woken up and eating. Alfredo asks, do cheetahs live here? Sorry, I didn't hear the question. I think it was cheetahs. And yes, Alfredo, cheetahs do live here. They tend to be more diurnal or day active and we don't see them. After dark, foxes. Sorry, Alfredo, I misheard your question. Do foxes live here? We don't have any foxes down here in Southern Africa, but we do have a very similar animal, Alfredo. It's called a jackal, and it looks just like a fox, that pointy nose, those pointy ears, and runs like a fox. And the jackals are also quite nocturnal. You do get foxes up in North Africa, in Ethiopia. You get a simian fox, or an Ethiopian wolf. And then you get a very small little fox, I think in the Atlas Mountains, right up in the north of Africa. But down in the south here, we have bat-eared foxes in Botswana. And that is a country just north of us, a neighboring country. Um, that is much drier and in the open, more desert, dry, sandy habitats, we get bat-eared foxes. Oh, sorry, I didn't get that question either. If you could repeat that, please. Oh, look at his ears, gone flat. So that's what happens if he thinks he spots a predator, someone that might be after him, which in this case must be an owl. Where is? Oh, Hadesa, where does the 
How does the rabbit know where his family is? Well, rabbits aren't very social. Or well, this scrub here, rather, isn't very social. They're quite happy on their own, and unless it's a female, unless it's a mommy hare with its youngsters, they don't really bother. But they do know if they are needing to be in touch with other family members, like a mother hare with her youngsters, they usually locate each other by smell. She'll be able to smell where her babies are hiding. It's very busy having some breakfast. So while we carry on watching this scrub here having breakfast, you're going to go and join Chloe, who's got something cool under the microscope for you. Yes, boys and girls, I'm sure you've enjoyed uh, the scrub here, but I have a special equipment called a microscope. This is the microscope, and there's a feather down there. So I'm looking at these little features of these feathers. So we'll be looking at this feather using a microscope. Yes, look how awesome is that. And you can see that uh, why golden band in the middle of your screen there, the thick one, it's called a shaft. And then those thin ones going to the sides there, they are called barbs. And then barbs, between them there, you'll find the barbules, and that's the hairy stuff you can see on your screen there. And, and you can also find the hooks between that. So the barbules, they attach each other with the hooks that's why you see the feathers so well connected and this feather belongs to a francolin because of the coloration because you know there's a there's a spirit called the crested francolin it's goldish in color and brown and white and black so i think because of, because of the stripes, it is a uh, crested francolin. Did you enjoy that? Yes. And we have some other thing for me to show you just for a few seconds. Wait a little bit. We'll be showing you a dropping. I have a dropping of a bird here. You can see this dropping of a bird. Let's put it in the microscope. Yes. And look at the features there. Did you see that? Amazing. You can see the white color and some brownish black stuff there. That's a dropping because birds, sometimes uh, they do eat meat, and seeds, grasses, and fruits. And the white stuff there, sometimes it's known to, to be urine because uh, birds, they don't uh, go to the bathroom like us. They go to the bathroom differently. So. Amazing and check those colors. It looks like it's a soup You can see all the features using this equipment It's a special equipment that we rely on to look at these special features of these Tiny flimsy things and if I can put an insect there you will see all the interesting things But for now I don't have uh, much time to show you that, but next time when you watch again, I'll make sure of that, that I give you all the exciting little things. So, I'll be closing down the tent because it's windy and I'll be going back to the camp where I'm staying. But for now, let's go to Jamie, who might be showing you the leopard. It is very, very windy. I'm afraid, unfortunately, the leopard walked into an area where we couldn't follow her, which was very, very unfortunate. But perhaps, you know, next time you come out on a safari with us, you'll get to see her again. Or perhaps you'll see a different leopard. So what I thought I would do is try and drive quite quickly 
to so that you could meet some of the other animals that I really really like and they live well they don't actually live there or oh, I've changed my mind there's at least something for you to look at it is oopsie that's not right it's over there over sort of there ish in the darkness Landon, you want to know where is it gone? There it is on the right hand side there. The other right, the other right, down, there. That's what I wanted, sorry, not the Impala. <laughs> I was going for a scrub here. Landon wants to know how different animals communicate. Landon, lots of different ways, and the scrub here is a perfect example. One of the ways that they communicate is through visual communication, so body language, and that's actually one of the most important. They move their ears, they move their face, they move their tail, and that means different things to different animals animals so if their ears go flat back against their back then it might mean that the animal's scared they also communicate through smell and they can communicate through sounds as well so they might make all sorts of sounds that would be um, telling different animals something about them or communicating to them Right, so that's just some of the ways that animals communicate to each other. Uh, the most important is probably through body language or through sound. Now, unfortunately, speaking of that, it's my, it's my unfortunate duty to communicate to you that it is at the end of our safari. So for all of our kids joining us, you have to go about the rest of your day. For all of our regular viewers, thank you very, very much. We will catch you tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Safari. We hope that you've had fun on the back of the safari vehicle with us. Thank you as always for your questions and your comments.